Well, good morning, Thrive family. It's good to be together. And um, we are going to pause today. Remember I told you, uh, we can do that every now and then. We can pause from Samuel. You know, we'll be there for a while anyway. Um, But uh, this morning, I really want us to take a look at, um, and we've kind of done this before. Um, We talked about the body. You know, we're a family. We're a body in Christ. We're a small, small part of a much larger body in in Jesus Christ uh, around the world. And, uh, you know, it really serves us well to remember that, to remember that it's by the blood of Christ that we are uh, we're united as one, as one family. And this morning, uh, you know, in light of what's happening in our world, in light of some of the events that are taking place and uh, uh, crossing the lines with many of you in a very poignant and real way, we, uh, as elders have been talking about this and praying about this, we just want to talk a little bit about uh, unity in the body of Christ. And, and I'll tell you, I'm so thankful and blessed by you guys here at Thrive. Um, I love to see and hear uh, what God is doing just by people loving one another. It's amazing. There's so many stories and testimonies. We could burn every Sunday just talking about how you guys are loving each other and accepting one another and really vitalizing authenticity uh, in so many ways, even obviously beyond the Thrive Group level. So uh, we're, we're blessed by that. But I just want us to camp out on this idea of unity. And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about division because division happens. We're going to talk about diversity um, but what does that look like, and how do we maintain unity in the midst of that? And um, so uh, it's going to be a morning, you guys. <laughs> I aspire to do this this morning. And, um, but listen, a couple of weeks back, we shared this with you, and many of you uh, were there. I'm going to set my timer. Pay, pay no attention to me. I mean, I actually do pay attention, but just not right to say uh, now you can pay attention. Um, we, you know, a couple of weeks ago, like we shared with you guys, we had this day of, of prayer and fasting. And uh, so much fruit came out of that day. Um, you know, obviously to begin with, 50 or more folks who were gathered for the entirety of the day just seeking the Lord's will. And, and we know when we do that, God is going to move. And certainly, uh, you know, God, God did move. Um, but one of the things that, that came out of that, a lot of things came out of that, but, but God is stretching our culture here at Thrive Christian Fellowship in a phenomenal way. And He's really encouraging us to relinquish more to Him in prayer. Simply put, we got to pray more. <laughs> you know, as a body, as families within the body, and as individuals truly seeking the Lord for His direction. Um, and, and one of the takeaways from, uh, from the day was just this just realization of the necessity of unity in the church. And not just here at Thrive, but amongst the churches in King George and just in the church as the body of Christ. Many of you have a heart to see in the face of in the presence of the world that we live in, to see a church that's united. Because when we're united on the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can take a message that's going to change the world. But if we're not united on the gospel of Jesus Christ, we could be part of the problem. So that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, This unity, uh, so much can, so much should, and so much does unite us. And that's where we'll begin uh, this morning. Um, but again, a lot can divide us as well. What did Jesus say in Matthew? And by the way, um, if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, please do, but it's going to be a while before we get there. So, But Philippians chapter 2, because we're going to be all over the Bible today, but that's going to be kind of the, the key portion of Scripture that we'll look at. But put a finger or a bookmark in it and, and, and hang tight. But in Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus said this. He said, every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Which means what? It will fall, right? We read that very clearly. So where there's disunity, there will be a fall. And falls hurt, and falls can destroy, right? So again, in the spirit of that, uh, we'll talk this morning about that unity that we have uh, as one body, as one body in Christ. But, but it's important to acknowledge that a lot can divide people. And let's begin there. Let's get this out of the way. Uh, this is very important that we talk about this. Uh, and I'll say this to begin with. A degree of division is necessary. Um, before you tune out, hang on. Let's dig into this a bit. When someone is not abiding in the essentials of the faith, meaning in the areas where God's word, scripture, is clear, we have to cling to truth. That's what Christians do. We're we're followers of Christ who adhere to the word of God. It's a living word. 
So if you will, let's say this, truth divides. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? Truth divides. And while it might hurt that that division happens, it's okay because we're standing upon truth. Um, so, you know, we hear this a lot today. We hear this a lot in, in the spirit of unity. Let's just unify. Let's come together. And, and I get that. And, and in Christ and upon the truth, we need to do that. But there is the need for some division regarding this area of truth. Now, I've shared this with you guys before, so instead of bringing up a new illustration, I'll just kind of wear this thing out. I'll share the same illustration again. If you're sick of hearing it, then that means you remember it, which is a good thing, <laughs> all right? So I could, you know, if a group of folks go out today and tout as they drive out of the school and they turn here at 205 and Route 3, if they want to contend that that red light means go, and there's another group of people that want to contend that that red light means stop, then what are we going to have? We're going to have confusion, and we're going to have devastation on the roads, right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, wait a minute, hold on. No, no, no. Uh, all the Christmas songs don't, you know, let there be peace. Well, I guess it's not a Christmas song. But all the, all the songs, you talk about peace, they're cute songs. And yes, Jesus does bring peace. And we sang that this morning, fill me with your peace, Holy Spirit. And he'll do that. But listen, at the core of Jesus coming to earth, he tells us that he came to bring a sword. Why so? Because Jesus didn't come to compromise. He did not come to compromise. Truth is unchanging and unbending and uncompromisable. And by nature, it's exclusive and it can be divisive. I'm not talking about the attitude with which we hold to the truth. No, no, no. I'm talking about the truth itself. It can be divisive. But again, that's necessary. Uh, it's a very necessary thing because it's not about personality and it's not about preference. So we're going to make some points this morning and we're even going to not make some points this morning. I was trying to figure out how to best put some of these points into points and I couldn't even come up with it. So I just left some blank on your paper. Have at it. You create your own points. All right, turn this thing into whatever the Lord speaks to your heart. But we will make a few clear ones. Point number one, let's start with this. Truth divides and in this case, division is necessary. Truth divides. Truth divides. Again, I tell the officer, I'm sorry, but I believe red means go. Won't cut it, will it? Won't cut it. Because anything goes doesn't go. We know that. Um, now, I will say this with respect, but that's why, for example, and I'm going to throw some examples out this morning. Because listen, if I don't give examples of some of these things I'm talking about, if I just don't say the words, I'm going to miss an opportunity. And I'm not going to do that this morning. Um, so all of this, everything I say this morning is with absolute respect to people who would disagree with me and perhaps disagree with us. So let's just put that out there, okay? But for example, the Mormons. This is why we cannot fellowship with Mormons. Now, now listen, that doesn't mean you don't talk to Mormons. It doesn't mean you don't have friends that are Mormons. It doesn't mean you hang, don't hang out with Mormons. I'm not saying that. But there's a division there. They have a degree of morality, absolutely. And there's some great folks. But their belief system is not built upon biblical truth, okay? So there's a, there's a natural division that is there. I would contend that it is a very different gospel, okay? Um, Galatians chapter 1, Paul tells us this. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed, so, so, again, it's based upon the gospel of truth. So truth divides. Truth divides. It can divide. And I'm not talking about this vindictive, nasty, arrogant, social media arousing mess that we see in our world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying truth, by definition, separates. And we see that among the faith practices. But then add to that culture and society. Add, look at the cultural issues that we're dealing with today. Look at the societal issues that make up, I don't care where you look for news, it's going to be the top five of every single uh, you know, news media that's out there. Issues that spark division. And listen, let's be truthful. These issues can spill into the church as well. And you know what? Maybe sometimes they need to. And maybe we as God's people who hold on to the truth need to deal with these issues according to to the scripture, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. I'm going to read some examples, and um, here we go. I'm just going to say these words, because these things are happening in our society right now. Issues of race, and class, 
and ethnic group issues. We've got critical race theory. We've got social justice. We've got Black Lives Matter. We've got cancel culture, the economy, political persuasions, the climate, homosexuality, abortion. I could continue for 20 years because all these things are happening in the world that we live in today. The Bible doesn't speak directly to a number. Directly it doesn't speak to a number of these issues. Why? Because they didn't exist back then. However, there are tenets or principles behind many of these current issues that do have clear biblical support or opposition. And as the church, we have to stand upon God's word when it comes to these matters. So viewing these, viewing all issues, viewing any issue in life, it's not just these issue, issues, but it's anything. As followers of Christ, I hope we look at everything by, uh, by way of the truth of God, not by how we feel or what media tells us or what our friends tell us or what the group we hang out with tell us or what everybody in my world or my family or my community might think. It doesn't matter. Uh, they can certainly affect us. But we need to look at things, uh, at everything, through what we call a biblical worldview. What is a worldview? It's the comprehensive conception of the world from a specific standpoint. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody's looking at everything through, through some sort of, of lenses, okay? And it's like these glasses. Well, I can't see you guys at all right now, okay? I mean, but now, you know, it's like now I can see you. And it's like the Bible, when we take God's word, and uh, y'all look way different without these. Wow. Man. I was about to make a joke that I'm not going to make. <laughs> but we have to look through the lens of Scripture. Um, point number two, following along. And we have to look at social issues, any issues like this. Issues must be viewed and examined through the lens of Scripture. And this is what we call a biblical worldview. And I, I hope one day, I know we had the, 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 the foundations of the faith class. David taught us that a while back. I hope one, one of these days, I'm throwing this out there, I hope... Elders, we haven't talked about it, but I'm just throwing it out there. We, yeah, they love it. When, yeah. Maybe we can do a biblical worldview class. We can talk about what it means to see the world through the lens of Scripture. I'd go for that. I'm not going to teach that, but I'll attend it, and I'll, somebody else could teach in here, and I'll take that. I love that. Um, simply, guys, listen. What does the Bible have to say about that, about whatever that is? What is that built upon? Which assumes that we hold that the Bible is authority and that it's infallible, that it's not going to lead us astray. And we absolutely hold to that. I'm going to throw the, our teach slide up here. We have six values as a church. One of our values is to teach God's word as authority and the foundation upon which we build our lives. Uh, it happens to be the T and thrive. It happens to be the first, not necessarily the most important, but I would venture to say it probably could be, definitely is, maybe is. <laughs> the most important is we stand upon the authority of, of Scripture. I'm going to give you a personal, not personal, I'm going to give you an example um, this is going to raise some feathers, and, uh, and, and that's okay, uh, because we need to talk about these things. I want to talk about, and everybody's talking about it, and I've never said, I've never addressed this from the pulpit, and uh, this is not the title of the message, by the way, and, and, we're, and I'm not going to do a series on all these social events. I'm just going to make a comment on this, and we're going to move on. Let's talk for a moment about critical race theory, okay? At this point, we get taken off the internet. I'm sure, but that's okay. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not, just, just hang on here. This is a very complex issue. And, and I will tell you that I can't put this thing to rest in 30 seconds or 30 days or maybe 30 years. Um, and one of the things, guys, we have to be very careful about, please, and I've said this before and we've said this before, don't just buy everything everybody tells you. Go to the source. You know, if you want to find out about how to change the oil in a 1985 Ford Ranger, the best thing you can do is go to a 1985 Ford Ranger manual, right? I, I don't want to talk at the coffee shop, so how do you think I should do this? What do you think about it? We need to go to the source when we're doing our research, and we need to, we need to compare what we think to what the actual source says. So let, I'll just say that and, and move on. But this critical race theory, it can be problematic. It can be a problematic issue. Now, I haven't studied it deeply, so don't like, sit on the edge of your seats and expect me to give a whole dialogue or monologue about this. But listen, it can be problematic, as many things can be problematic, not because of the politics behind it, and not because it's not mentioned in the Bible. It can be problematic because the explanation that it gives regarding humankind and sin and redemption is not 
compatible with Scripture. That's where the red flag is, and that's where we need to be looking. What is this issue about? From the source, not from the news, because I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the news is spun. <laughs> Did I shock somebody? The news is spun. Remember visiting, I remember I grew up in the Northern Neck and I used to go to George Washington's birthplace all the time and the lady would sit there and no, I'm not slamming, it's because she was a lady, it was a lady, that's who did it. I went every year and she was sitting there spinning that spinning wheel and she was, I used to, get, I was mesmerized. And she's taking, she's taking sheep fur, man, and turning it into yarn, it was a, but she's spinning. It totally changes it. And guys, the news spins things. Oh, and I've gone on this rabbit trail, I don't even remember what I was saying. Um, Listen, take the source information and then go to the source of truth, which is God's word, and do a right comparison and see where we are left with. Again, when we look more closely through the lens of Scripture at any position and find that that position, whatever it is, doesn't align with biblical truth, then that position stands to be in error. Okay? Not only is looking through the lens of Scripture something we can do, it's something we should do. We shouldn't just go with culture. Right? Each one of us has to stand upon our Christian beliefs, which are rooted in Scripture. And we also, at the same time, need to enter the public arena and apply what we know to be true to the current issues and trends of today. Meaning what? We're not closet Christians. We don't get to talk about these things here on Sunday and then pretend we don't know about it the rest of the week. So we've got truth dividing, we've got culture issues coming and then more division can ensue from that. But another level can cause tension and division as well. And this is something that's, that's uh, peculiar only to the actual church. And, and, and you'll see why because of what we're going to talk about here. But this is the area of personal conviction. Now, because of what a personal conviction truly is biblically, this isn't something that anyone but a follower of Christ is going to have. Now, people who don't follow Christ can have personal convictions, but it's not rooted the same way the personal conviction that we're talking about today is going to be rooted in Scripture. So what is a personal conviction? Let's define it. Point number three. Okay? Point number three. A personal conviction is a boundary within which God has called you to live. Very simple. Whether that's a command or a prohibition. So it's a boundary. God said, don't cross this line. Or God has said, you need to cross this line. It's one or the other. It's from the Lord. A personal conviction, biblically, comes from having a walk with Christ. It comes through seeking God in His Word. It comes through prayer. It comes through a relationship with Him. It comes through fasting. Guys, it comes through seeking God. Okay, it's spirit-directed. It's not socially directed. It's not media-directed. It's not directed by our friends or our family or our acquaintances or even those around us in, in, in church. Romans chapter 14. Let me read this to you. If you'd like to turn there, I didn't tell you to turn there. You can if you'd like to. Romans chapter 14. But we need to scoot along here. Um, Romans chapter 14 says this, verses 1 through 4. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, not but do not, excuse me, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then fast forwarding to verse 23. Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So, hello. Let me provide one current example of this, and then we're going to dissect personal conviction a bit here. But the very current and very real example of the COVID vaccine. Many of us are talking about that. Um, Listen, some of you have received the vaccine. Others are considering the vaccine. Others considered it, didn't want it, considered it, reconsidered it, received it. Some of you are, are torn either way. And, and, and some of you have said, no way will I receive the vaccine. Yet, in this room alone, every single one of these groups is represented. We're all here. We're all here. Do you see how we could turn this thing into a categorical grouping that would divide? 
And this is just one example, albeit it is a very present and very real example. And I've spoken to a number of you guys these past couple weeks about this issue. We've had conversations about this. Thank you for calling me. Thank you that we can have these conversations. Let me, let me r- real quick, is conscientious objection okay? What is that? Objection for reasons of conscience or, or to complying with a particular requirement. Is that okay? Absolutely that's okay. Certainly that's okay. And one should not look down on another for taking that position. And one should not look down on another for not taking that position. Is that, is that, you see what I'm saying? The whole problem is looking down on somebody. That's the problem. That's where the enemy goes, oh yeah. Let's divide them. Jesus is like, no, not by my blood. That's not what this is about. Not at all. So regarding this vaccine, receiving it or not, believing in it or not, agreeing with it, the mandate for it or not, we cannot allow a personal conviction to be a tool that divides us. So with that, to better understand this whole idea of personal conviction, I think it's helpful to see what a personal conviction is not. Sometimes it's, it's easier to know what something is by seeing what it is not. I've got four knots for you. Couldn't figure out how to put this in the blanks. Have added on your note sheet if you so desire. But first of all, a personal conviction is not something that is specified in the Bible. Meaning there is no chapter and verse that says this is or is not right. It's not there, okay? The Bible doesn't spell it out as a right or as a wrong for everyone. It's something that he writes on your heart personally by the Holy Spirit. Now let me share this. Do not confuse that with subjective truth. What do I mean by that? It's not instead of biblical truth, I'm convicted about this thing. No, 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 because then that violates Scripture. God is never going to personally convict us to do something that's against Scripture, right? Therein, truth is now changing, which goes back to the first piece of argument, that, not argument, I'm not arguing, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first point that we made about truth being device, we have to stand up on the truth. So it's not that truth is subjective. It's not instead of biblical truth, but it's in the presence of biblical truth. As you read scripture and you live in a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit impresses something on your heart and is not to be taken lightly. So it's not to be confused with subjective truth, nor is it to be confused with absolute truth for everyone. I'll give you an example. Murder is wrong. Murder is wrong as a statement is not a conviction. Whether I feel like I like that statement or agree with that or not, that is not a conviction. That is a statement of truth from God's Word. Okay, so a personal conviction is not something specified in, in the Bible. It's not subjective truth, and it's not absolute truth either, okay, for everybody. Secondly, a personal conviction is not a preference. It is not just, just my, might I put the word just in there, it's not just a preference. It's more than that. For example, I prefer coffee over tea. I can drink tea, but I'm not sinning if I drink coffee, but I could be if I'm drinking tea. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Do you see what I'm saying? That's a preference thing. That's a preference thing. Verse 23 says, whatever doesn't proceed from faith is sin. Meaning what? If God has impressed upon my heart that something is wrong, then for me, it's wrong. Okay? Personal conviction is not a preference, though. Thirdly, personal conviction is not something that others put on you. It's not something we're guilted into by others. And a number of you are struggling with this right now. Either way, whether it's about the vaccine or any one of another million things that are going on in your world, you're being pressured to conform by, by someone. It's not something we're guilted into. It's not something we're pressured into. And likewise, here, me, it's not something that we pressure anyone else about either, okay? Romans 14, 22, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Meaning we could be so right that we're wrong. I have personal convictions. You mean to tell you some of them? No. It's the whole point. I don't talk about my personal convictions. I don't talk about them much hardly at home. I don't talk about them here. I don't need to talk about them. It's not public information. Why? Because I'm going to sway somebody, and that's not the point. And it's not, and, and, and some of you might think I'm the weirdest loser in the world if I were to talk about my personal convictions. You're like, dude, you're like weird. Well, I already know that. You know? So, again, but I, I can't tout my convictions as hard, fast biblical truth for you. 
or for anyone. Because that's blurring the lines. And you know what that's, that is? That's unbiblical. That's unbiblical, and I can't do that. Listen, it's not political position. It's not some social norm, and it's not a pet peeve. Personal convictions are none of those things. It's based upon God's Word. It's based upon the Holy Spirit in my walk and my journey with Him, okay? God convicted me years ago to, um, well, to plant Thrive Christian Fellowship. God put on my heart King George in the Northern Neck, and he said, I want you to go plant Thrive Christian Fellowship, although he didn't, I wish he had given us the name that quick. He didn't, but anyway. But he said, go plant this church. Now listen, listen. If I hadn't done that, I would have been sinning against God. I believe that. But that doesn't mean anybody here has to go plant a church. It doesn't mean that, right? Unless God has told you to. And if he has, um, let's talk. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Right? So live out your personal conviction. Listen, ours is never to take away from or to rewrite or to redefine what God's word says. We've, we've established that. But neither is it ours to add to his word and make it say something for anyone that it simply doesn't say. We have to be careful. And then lastly, what is, what is a, a, a personal conviction? It's not something we can ignore. Now we can ignore it, but we shouldn't ignore it. Because if I suppress or I ignore it, then for me, again, and we've established this, it's tantamount to sin for me, for not going with what God has spoken in my heart. Romans 14, 23, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So folks with personal you know, convictions don't just do what everybody says. They don't just jump when somebody says jump. Should we stand upon those convictions? Absolutely. Will there be times when those convictions present inconveniences? Absolutely. Like, for example, not being able to hang out with certain people? Yeah, that's not that big a deal. A bigger deal for many of you right now is the presence of this vaccine. Okay? I get that. It's not just a inconvenience. It's a problem. It's a dilemma that you're facing, and you're praying through it. And I would encourage you and urge you to continue to pray for God's wisdom as you make these decisions. I mean, even in this room right now, there, and you know, we've talked about this already, but there, there are diverging points of view, you know, paths going in different directions, separating, you know, differing opinions and methods. Everybody here, though, as individuals and families, we have to make decisions. We have to seek the Lord and His Word, not politics, not pundits, and, and again, not even each other. We have to follow His direction. In the spirit of Christian duty and in the spirit of Christian unity, we have to make decisions while not being divisive. Point number four, Christian unity is both a gift we have been given and a gift we are to maintain. It's a gift we've been given. And it's also a gift that we have to maintain. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, and we've, I've shared on this not too many weeks ago. Paul says, maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Well, how do we do that? I'm going to finish with this this morning. I'm at 26 minutes. I'm doing much better than I thought I'd be doing at this point. But we're not done yet. So hang in there. Okay. Let's do this. I just feel led to do it. We're going to do it. Everybody stand. <clears throat> I think we have these on the screen for you. Uh, I'm actually going to read from the amplified version of the Bible because there's parentheses there that elaborates the Greek behind some of these words, but it puts it into English. And Here, together, I want to read this. And let's just, Father, speak to our heart as we read your word right now, Lord. I ask that you would move your spirit within us. And God, may these words not just be words on a page or on a screen or on a tablet or whatever, but Lord, words upon our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says, therefore, if there is any encouragement and comfort in Christ, as there certainly is in abundance, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship that we share in the Spirit, if there is any great depth of affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love toward one another, knit together in Spirit, intent on one purpose, and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel, the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous. 
Regard others as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. So, I mean, don't think like we're going to start like standing and sitting and all this a bunch. I just sometimes, you know, when we read God's word, just want to stand in his presence, you know. Sometimes he just calls us to do that. So Paul tells us what we have in Christ here. And to base what we do, to base how we live on what we've been given in Christ. Now, real quick, I shared this back in the summer of 69. No, I'm kidding. I shared it a long time ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> The if here, all the ifs, the if statements that you read in this, most versions will say, if you have, if you have, if you have. This is a rhetorical device that Paul is using. He's crafty that way. God gifted him. But if means since, okay? Because every single one of these we have experienced in Christ. So when you see the word if, if you replace it with since, S-I-N-C-E, it makes sense. Anyway, you get what I'm saying, okay? So here's what we've been given. Encouragement and comfort in Christ, Okay? to come alongside, to assist, to help. It could mean exhort. Guys, we've been given the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us has the same Holy Spirit living within us. And He is within us, and He comes alongside of us to comfort us, to help us. He is the paraclete. He is the helper. He's the one Jesus promised would come. Hebrews 4, to help us in the time of need. Okay? And he does that with abundance. He's our very present help. So we have encouragement and comfort in Christ. Secondly, consolation of his love. Consolation of his love, which is ever present, guys. The Bible tells us, 1 John, that that perfect love, which can only be found in God, that perfect love drives out or casts away fear, right? This love sustains us in times of fear. His love sustains us along with His truth in times of anxiety. And fear and anxiety can threaten us. Side note, fear is an arrow, guys, of the enemy. It's one of the wiles of the devil. It's one of the schemes of Satan that we read about in Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul tells us to put on the armor so we can resist the arrows, that we can resist the schemes, we can resist the wiles of the devil, and fear is one of those. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of fear going on in our world today. And unfortunately, there's a lot of fear and anxiety going on in the church today. We need to stay away from the things that feed fear and anxiety. I know that seems overly simplistic. What, are you just going to get on the, on, the, on the dude's rocket and go to Mars? That's about the only place that there's no fear. I tell you what, I'm not going to Mars. <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot of fear here. I get that. But, but listen, stay away. I'm just going to throw this out there. Social media, other media, commentary, which can be saturated with gossip and slander, and all this feeds fear and angst. Some of us just need to just hang it up. I'm not saying any of that stuff's bad. But I'm saying if it's feeding all of this fear and anxiety and 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 does that translate? If it's feeding that, just walk away from it. It's not worth it. Yeah, but that means I might have to walk away from some people. Then do it. Sometimes we have to do that. We really do. You know, sometimes we have we have to do that. God has given us a spirit of love and self-control, 2 Timothy 1.7. Romans 8.15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So what do we do? We need to starve the bad, we need to nurture the good, we need to get alone, and we need to cry out to Daddy in times of fear and anxiety. And that stuff will go, man. Got to starve it. So we have this love, this consolation of his love. We also have fellowship. We have participation of the Spirit. Again, the same Spirit, this Greek word koinonia, we could do 20 weeks on that word, this joint participation, this intimacy, this we have in common. It's more, guys, we have more in common than some blood relatives and families because the blood of Christ pulses through our spiritual hearts. How many of you don't raise your hand or closer to people next to you in this church than you are your own family because of Christ? The same Spirit lives in everybody here. 
let's get back to the vaccine. Those who agree with it, same spirit. Those who will never take it, same spirit. Same spirit. The spirit's bigger. One spirit, one baptism, one Lord, one church, one faith. It's one. It's one in him, right? So all that other stuff is secondary. We have that Holy Spirit. He is living in each of us. So we do participate together in the Holy Spirit. We just don't think about that enough. We don't think about that enough because we're being duped by the world to think about our differences sometimes instead of concentrating on what we have in common. And then fourthly, affection and compassion or sympathy or mercy or tenderness. This whole idea of feeling other people's pain in the presence of trial, not focusing on my own perspective or my own viewpoint or feelings, but meeting someone else where they are. Y'all, your pastor has a problem with this one. Because so often I'm so fixed on my perspective that I won't bend. And that's not good. It's not good for any of us. Definitely not good for me. It's not good for any of us. But we have been given this sympathy and mercy and tenderness from the Lord. So since we have these things, Paul says, then meditate on them, lean on them, pray them. Going back to this idea of worldview, may we view our world and our personal identity through the lens of this very verse. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. This is who we are. This is what we have been given. I want to take that and I want to look at the world and the people around me through the lens of that, especially in context, those who are in the church. So what does Paul say do? He says, be like-minded, verse 2, with one another. Have this common, mutual, same love for one another. Live in one accord. Live in unity. Have one mind. Be united in purpose. Be united in direction. Be, be united in focus and goal. And I'm not talking about the societal goals because it's bigger goals that God's given us in the church and bigger, a bigger mission. In times of adversity, in times of diversity, we focus on unity that we have in Christ. Not uniformity. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be the same. Of course not. And it doesn't mean conformity, complying with standards that someone imposes on you. That's not the same. Unity is not conformity. Unity is not, um, uh, the other word I just said, uniformity. It's not uniformity and it's not conformity. Not at all. It's being one unit. You put the Y on the end of a word, back in my English days, means the state of or being in that state. So it's the state of being a unit. And that's what the church is. It's one unit. It's one unit. We come together. Paul also says to be intent on one purpose. The King, New King James says one accord. The NIV says one spirit and one mind. I like the Amplified saying intent on one purpose. Amplified says living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel. The good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. Guys, that's the mission of the church. That is the mission of the church. While we're to biblically address and respond to and engage with current events and trends and you name it, it is not the church's mission to directly change society. It's not our mission. The church's mission is to advance the kingdom of God and nurture the faith of Christ's followers. And will that impact society? Absolutely. If we stand on that truth and we live that truth out, even in the public arena, you bet it will change society. I frequently of late have been appreciating a lot of what Pastor Alistair Begg shares at Parkside Church. And, and I happened to catch a part of one of his messages recently. And I'm going to quote him because who can say it like him, right? Sometimes. Uh, I don't have the accent, but that's okay. He's not from the Northern Neck. I'll, it's all right. Here's what he says. Social, political, economic issues, as important as they may be, are not the central mission of the church. When the peripheral becomes the central, the central becomes the peripheral, end quote. So guys, let's never make the gospel of salvation a peripheral issue to societal issues. Let's never do that. There was a Welsh minister, many of you know his name, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He pastored at Westminster Chapel for 30 years or so and phenomenal preacher. But in our own country in the 40s and 50s, uh, the fear of communism was huge, you know, and... and um, just the whole idea that communism is going to impact negatively Western society, and that was a real threat. Um, but here's what he said, and I, and I appreciate what, what he said. He says, if we spend our whole time talking against them, we will never win them. Now, sit on that for a second. doesn't mean we agree with them. 
It just means that our primary goal is not to change that. It's to see that the gospel gets to them. Think about those in your sphere of influence right now. Think about leaders around the world in our own country. If we villainize them, how will we gain an audience with people with whom to share the gospel? It doesn't mean we agree with them. It just means let's not villainize them. Paul goes on to talk in verses 3 and 4 about humility and regarding others as more important than yourself and looking out for others' interests. All these things, guys, that we do, that we do as a result of what we have in Christ. I encourage you to go home and really dig into Philippians chapter 2, the first four verses. There's way more there than we'll ever, ever be able to contend with in about 40 minutes is what it looks like it's going to be today. You know, more, way more than we can do. I just want to say this, you guys. I think folks here at Thrive are handling issues quite well. I really do, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for what God's given us, you know. In the presence um, of everything that's buzzing around, uh, it's just an exhortation to keep our hearts in line with the Lord's mission for us and not to get sidetracked by the enemy's tactics, no matter how large or all-encompassing those tactics might seem, right? Now, it's okay to talk about these issues. It's okay to have and ask questions about these issues and offer perspectives in the spirit of conversation. Absolutely. Because our Christian worldview affects everything. If, if we're to look at everything through that lens, then, well, let's look at everything. So let's not shy away from issues. We don't want to bury our heads in the sand and pretend current issues don't exist or that they don't affect us. And I'm going to tell you now that elders here are praying for you guys who are wrestling, for example, with this vaccine. We are praying for you. If you need help, if you need prayer, if you need to talk, please seek one of us out, okay? This is not about personal conviction. This is about we are brothers in the Lord and we want to come alongside you and help you. Whatever your, whatever your thing might be, it might be something totally different, right? We just want to approach things biblically. and We don't want to forsake the mission of the church. We want to come together and see what God's word has to say. We want to pray for one another. We want to encourage one another to stay on track with the mission that God has called us to. And I know even as believers, we're going to disagree on some issues, even, even when we look through the lens of Scripture. We're going to. That's why Paul, throughout the letters, urged the churches to be united. Because differences happen. We know that. Here's what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says. Paul says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to be known for. William Barclay of this very of these verses that we looked at this morning in Philippians. Here's what he said. He said, The one danger which threatened the Philippian church was that of disunity. There is a sense in which that is the danger of every healthy church. It is when people are really in earnest, when their beliefs really matter to them, that they are apt to get up against each other. The greater their enthusiasm, the greater the danger that they may collide. It is against that danger Paul wished to safeguard his friend. I very much uh, agree with that. So guys, I'll close it. Looking back at some major points here, we divide with the world when it comes to objective truth because truth divides. Okay, we made that clear. Within the church as believers, we need to approach current culture, social issues through the lens of God's word. We need to be convicted about certain things. Let the Lord speak to our hearts, operate within us. Listen, don't, don't knock somebody down when the Holy Spirit's working in their life. Encourage them. It might be different from how he's working and speaking to you, but encourage them. Encourage them. So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to celebrate communion together. Talk about coming together in a common union. What better time? And now, Jesus came to die on the cross to rescue us from sin and death. And by virtue of us trusting what he did for us, we are given birth into the church to be called sons and daughters of God. And we have the blood of Christ that holds us together in a common unity. And this morning, we celebrate what Jesus did for us as he died as he was buried, and as he rose from the grave. We can put all of our differences aside, amen? 
We can put all our pet peeves and our personal convictions and our positions on anything aside. Because when I'm standing before Jesus and trying to muster up a thank you for dying for me, I don't think the first thing out of my mouth is, so where do you really stand on? <laughs> no. I don't, I don't think I'm going to have words. None of us will. So guys, sins to confess, let's do that now. Cry your heart out to the Lord. Father, work in me. Take some time to just pause and reflect. Now I'm going to invite Michelle if she could come up. Is she around? Yeah, if you could just kind of come in, um, in, in any of you guys, just some instrumental music there in the background, and you guys just spend some time with the Lord. And um, maybe God's speaking to you about something that was said this morning. Or, um, you just need to talk to the Lord, and, 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 and you need to praise Him just from your seat. Do that. Um, we're going to ask uh, a member from each family to go. We've got two tables up front, and I think we have a table or two in the back. Are there two in the back or just one? There's two in the back, two in the front. So if a family member from each family could just go and get the elements for your family, hold them, okay? Hold them. And uh, David is going to come up and lead us in a time of reflection here at the end. Just take some time with the Lord. Don't worry about the clock, right? And just uh, allow the Lord to speak to your heart.